Hello and welcome to everybody who's joined us uh, for the Great Imagining Action Research Symposium. This is a public online action bringing together leading experts, creatives, regional partners, enthusiasts and young apprentices who will be helping to build the project in the coming months. This session that you've tuned into is Teaching for Creativity, Soft Skills Needed for Future Citizens. And our excellent panelists will be sharing their thoughts and insights into the theme, Future of the Arts. So I'm Heather Ackroyd of artist duo Ackroyd and Harvey and a co-founder of Culture Declares Emergency, launched last year in the spring and now numbering over a thousand artists and institutions who have declared climate and ecological emergency. I'll be working backstage with Gavin, uh, Gavin Turk, timekeeping and just sort of like keeping the chat and questions moving. And this session will be presented by the wonderful Sijoni Kwadu, who is joining us from New York. Welcome Sijoni. And I'll hand over to Gavin uh, to make more introductions to our panelists. And thanks again for joining us. Cheers, Gavin. Thank you. I think we're a bit over moderated here. We've got, we've got two moderators and what we've chosen to call uh, <laughs> what, we've, what we've chosen to call a presenter. And I don't even know if that's quite the right term. But um, what I, yes, yeah, so I feel like I'm slightly redundant here in a way. I, I think what I uh, am going to do is I'm just literally going to introduce the journey. But before I do that, I'm going to just tell each of the panelists that what they need to do is they need to just give a very short, just two sentence. Um, introduction to themselves and uh, and then and then make their answer to the question so um, and people do this all the time now and I re it really irritates me but they say without further ado but I'm not going to say that actually I'm just going to introduce Sojourne um, Aquido who's our presenter for this session thank you Sojourney. Hi everyone, I'm Sojourney Quaidu. Um, so the Great Imagining Project aims to promote a fairer, kinder, and greener future in schools. The questions I have for our speakers explore their experience in creative and educational fields. Their insight guides the Great Imagining's curriculum, which can inspire students to discover connections and cross-curriculars. I've tried to make a cross-disciplinary um, education in my current uh, college at the new school by majoring in multiple concentrations. So I'm eager for students to have this intersectional education at an early age. And so I believe I'll just, shall we start with each individual um, speaker to introduce a bit about yourself? Um, especially with, so Yosef O'Connor. I think, yeah, if you would just, um, Mr. Journey, if you would yes. probably say, sorry, you need to say people's names to get them to unmute and get going. Sorry, thank Definitely. you. Definitely. Okay. Um, I would love for you to start if that's right. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Joseph O'Connor. I'm from London. I'm an artist, curator. Um, and yeah, I'm honored to be here today. And um just launched a new project in piccadilly circus um taking over the screen so that's me <laughs> so i'm fascinated by the sense of collaboration in your work especially previous works like average joe and worthless um whether it's intentional or subconscious um in your current work with circa um which i will leave a link to in the chat for everyone to see you do this again with emerging and established artists your manifesto is agenda to break the cycle of the status quo of the art industry or even consumerism in general is challenging. Um, so can you describe a bit about the Circa economy for our audience and what drove you to spark that conversation? Yeah, sure. You make me sound impressive. <laughs> um, so um, I, I suppose Circa my, I, I was trying to get it together for two years um, and it kind of, you know, big projects um, like The Great Imagining where you have such huge ambition, it takes a lot to kind of persuade others to kind of follow the vision and to be progressive and, you know, to, to, to 
to persuade capitalism to pause adverts and to pause profit um, is no easy task, um, even if you're only doing it for two minutes every day. It's not even a 1% of their day. Um, but what was really important um, once we managed to kind of, you know, we got the project confirmed in May and then we launched on the 1st of October with, um, with Ai Weiwei, who's taken over for a month, was that the platform um, would be designed and created in a way um, that was inclusive and collaborative um, at its core. Um, it's collaborative with the audience because without an audience, there's no project. It's collaborative with the artist because you need the work and you need them to be able to kind of give it a huge amount of commitment. But these are all the different film titles that Ai Weiwei um, has created for his month. Uh, it starts in 1975 when he was in New York and it runs all the way through to the current pandemic. Um, he just uh, filmed a documentary in Wuhan and, and he chose to kind of uh, respond to the brief uh, by introspectively looking into his past, which I thought for someone who's always looking forward was quite um, an interesting choice, especially at this moment in history where I think we've all looked back. Um, but the circular economy is an element, like a subsidiary element. Um, it was a kind of a last minute idea. Um, can we sell prints to generate funds to then circulate from the pyramid? If the top of the project is like Piccadilly, how can we circulate that back into the struggling emerging network of artists who are post COVID going to, you know, struggle to rise up in the way that I weigh way in past generations have. Um, so the idea is very simple that we sell, Initially, we were saying we sell one print, but I want to change that word to artifact um, because different artists are going to want to create a different object to sell. So for Ai Weiwei, he's made a print. It's £100. Um, it's available to buy on our website on circle.art and all of the proceeds from that print circulates back. And um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, what we have done is we've made a commitment and we've made a pledge to um, support the UK's struggling creative community, but we haven't actually figured out how we're going to do it. Um, I just found out yesterday that we've sold 60,000 pounds of prints since the 1st of October. So like, we've, I'm pretty proud of how the team have managed to kind of pull that together. Um, and I think that rather than giving out small grants or small bursaries, direct to artists, I'd like to maybe give much more considerable um, amounts of cash, like 10, thousand pounds or you know 15 twenty thousand pounds and and find ways to actually support and make a difference to an artist so that's circa and that's that's the project lovely thank you this um makes me want to go to roly um keating um in the contrast of digital to analog i really would love for you to talk about the british library and where the conversation of digitalization is um, especially with this theory that libraries might not be needed in the future. Um, would love to hear you talk about that. And also okay. introduce yourself. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me introduce myself. Okay, lovely to see everybody. I'm Roly, um, and my job is Chief Executive at the British Library, the National Library of the UK. Um, but in an earlier life, uh, until 2012, I spent my time in broadcasting making TV programs, mostly about arts and culture, uh, and latterly um, looking after TV channels like BBC4, BBC2. So I've, and I've got a bit involved in the digital side there. So I, I'm, if you like, a, a refugee from broadcasting who's discovered the amazing world of libraries in the last decade. And yes, Johnny, you're right. When I took on this job, I was a little bit startled to hear really smart people telling me that maybe libraries weren't needed anymore uh, because we had Google, we had Amazon. So what on earth might you need libraries for in this day and age? And I can only say that it, for us at the British Library and looking around the country and the world, the opposite has never felt more true. Um, that actually libraries, particularly coming for me, coming from uh, the TV sector, libraries struck me as this incredibly powerful 
global network and they're not branded as a network but actually there's more sense of shared values commonality across libraries library professionals the people who use them whether it's public libraries national libraries like us schools universities prisons um, very very powerful independent of commerce politics religion uh, places of safety study expertise and the physicality of those spaces which is we're obviously missing at the moment quite powerfully in, in the COVID, is part of the power and part of the discussion it would be great to animate is how we can actually even in the age of those digital giants think about importing some of those library values um, about free access to information authenticity um, sort of uncorruptibility of the information source if you like back into the digital space because we know how difficult that is so i guess at the um uh, at, at the bl you know we we digitize our collections of course particularly the historic ones but it's been really striking for me in the time i've been here that the more certainly pre-covid that we digitized what we had instead of the library getting emptier it got fuller the queues got longer to come in every day because maybe digital raised the profile of what libraries can be, but also it accentuated that need to see real people in real spaces face to face. Um, so I think that's the, the, the journey I've been on. And I think I, I provocatively have occasionally said that libraries as a network of information and knowledge predated the internet and may yet outlast it. And I'm not entirely sure what I meant by that, but it still feels true. I definitely think that feels true as well. Um, Hattie, I would love for you to discuss, um, introduce yourself first, um, and then share a little bit about your project with Movement of Freedom. It's so captivating and vital for youth, especially on a global exchange level, um, which I will also, I can add a link of the video into the chat for everyone to see. Um, so yeah, if you could introduce yourself and then talk a little bit about that project. Hello, my name's Hattie Warboys and I'm an artist, movement teacher and the founder of Movement of Freedom. So Movement Freedom is a, um, it's been running for the last five years. It's an international project which connects uh, young people through movement. So I work with various groups of children within the UK and internationally and teach um, creative dance classes or, or, or kind of classes where, where which uh, provide a, a safe atmosphere for people to explore and play with movement and to um, become more versatile and communicating through movement. So, so the very base of the project is, is kind of exploring ways of connecting through movement. So um, then these, these children connect with each other through the movement, through um, video representation um, and film and through live virtual conversations. So, um, so, uh, so what was your question, Sejourni? Uh, yes, I just wanted you to talk a little bit about Movement of Freedom. Oh, okay. The audience. Right, yes. Yeah. So, um, I think in the email from Deborah, it said, what would your dream for the future be um, if you could imagine anything within your industry or specialism? So, so I was thinking that, that, that what my dream would be in, in, in within my experience of running this project would be uh, within education for, um, for there to be more value given to body awareness and, and communication through movement and all the, the, the the wisdom and the knowledge that lies within our bodies that, that's so kind of um, undervalued, I feel, in many ways at the moment. Um, and, and how, like, even now, for example, we're, we're, we're talking, we're all heads in rectangles, and what about the rest of our bodies? And, um, and so, um, so I, I, I would love to see um, dance classes being compulsory within schools, that, that would be fantastic. Or um, uh, I, I just, I feel that, that when, when people are given a, 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 an environment to, to explore movement and, and, and be playful and, 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 
and, and also to go very deep, it, it's amazing how much um, confidence and, and kind of, I guess, agency um, it, it can give the children, the young people and the adults and how it, it kind of takes away the, 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 protect, the protective layers of, of fear, whatever they may be, and it allows people to really um, connect in a much more intimate way, first with themselves, and once they, you know, to have more of a kind of understanding um, of what's, what your body tells you and your body awareness, then, then you will have more empathy with others. So it can stop the fear of the others as well. Um, which I think um, is very important as well with, with um, in, in this time where we're becoming increasingly um, virtual, uh, we're becoming a bit more separated from each other and, 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 and the way that we communicate is becoming increasingly image-based and, and not really a representation of who we really are. And, and, and so we can start by knowing ourselves better than we will understand others better. And I think dance is such a, a kind of primal form of communication that um, it can really break down a lot of barriers. Um, and uh, yeah, so happy to carry on talking if uh, anyone has any questions. Thank you. I'll actually transition to Miranda Jones. Um, your recent work into art therapy feels very, very um, personal right now. In this current semester, I've noticed lots of students at my school struggle with their own mental health at an increased level. And there's a real desire for positive change in this mentality to like not have to be stuck in that. Um, so with your knowledge also as a parent and a like avid community artist, and now recently art therapy, can you um, first introduce yourself? Sorry, I keep forgetting that. And then um, can you share how this current period we're living in has impacted your practice? Sure, okay. So I'm Miranda Jones, also known as Miranda Lamy Tanta. I'm an artist and um, I've done lots of community arts projects over the years, including with the House of Fairy Tales, which I guess is why I'm here. I'm also studying um, integrative art therapy at um, I8 in London. But I only just started, so I do feel like a beginner. But I've long kind of noticed how, you know, for me anyway, all, all the arts is therapeutic. And, and um, I've long noticed like how powerful art practices can be in terms of healing. So I guess that that was a motivation for getting deeper into that with the course. And in terms of answering your question, um, community arts, obviously the work is really thin on the ground now, like, like with so many things. The other thing I've got in my background, there's a lot of festival arts, a lot of stuff that, you know, in more underground settings like squats and protests, um, obviously festival arts, that's dried up. So that motivated me to look into the art therapy. But also I feel like everyone needs it now. Everyone needs therapy. And, you know, if we're talking about trying to um, engage young people, you know, and I, I, I love the idea of this project, asking young people to imagine the future that they want. This seems like, you know, such a brilliant, important thing to do. But before you're even going to engage them, there's layers and layers maybe to get through because um, in, in lots of cases there's trauma or there's barriers. Um, so like what Hattie was saying about, about the dance and the movement, I think you almost need techniques like that that are going to open up the space and they're going to... Um, involve and relax young people and then then the answers are going to come out and I also think we need to be talking to the young people themselves I had a quick straw poll this morning with young people around me about what kinds of things they would want to do you know what would inspire them what would what would draw them into this project um is that enough <laughs> yes I almost wanted to ask you about what they said but yeah I, I can tell you if you want yeah I would love to hear that if that's okay yeah, well, one suggestion, um, I was like, what art forms would you want to do? What would actually get you excited? And one suggestion was makeup. And, um, you know, she was talking about how she, that's how she loves to express herself is with her look. And, you know, so she'd want to go into that more. And that brought out a conversation about, you know, feeling restricted by uniforms, um, feeling restricted by a lot of the rules in school. Um, and it was like, well, imagine if there was two weeks where they didn't impose any of that on you. Um, and then um, 
Pearl was raising the point of like how a lot of the time feels very negative at school because the teachers are just, you know, really giving you a hard time a lot. And, um, you know, they're giving the whole class a hard time for the behavior of a few. That's quite standard, isn't it? And there's a lot of criticism in the atmosphere and how exhausting that is. So imagine if you could remove that temporarily or permanently and see as an experiment. Okay, so no criticism, no negativity. Um, what else came up? Oh yeah, amplifying, like talking about Black History Month and like how could you amplify that and do more around that. Um, music that was actually relevant music, the kind of music they're into, um, that came up. And then the other suggestion was like, was it was something that I'd written actually, was to have like a whole um, big variety of different things to try because everyone's different. So to be offering loads of things to try. So that's what we had from the three young people around me today. Lovely. Mm. Um, for, um, thank you, sorry. Um, for Hana Yamin, I would love for you to begin talking about um, your engagement with communities as an environmental lawyer in your current role, which encompasses building environmental and creative spaces for artists slash citizens. Can you share a bit about Think and Do in Camden and who you are? Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I, so I could listen to the other people uh, um, really a lot. So a lot of my professional life, uh, which I've uh, engaged in international climate negotiations and been part of the, the UN and worked with small island states and vulnerable countries, you know, has, has been very much based on on science and and particularly you know in the last sort of 20 30 years or so especially now the main sort of dominant sort of uh, narratives uh, and base of knowledge has been economics uh, and traditional economics you know so very much you know how much is climate change going to cost humanity you know how do we share the burdens of action who is going to be impacted how do we deal with you know, um, uh, industries that are badly impacted and so forth. So this has been my bread and butter and, uh, you know, the background that I had also having, having done sort of politics, philosophy and economics. These are the dominant sort of uh, narratives which public policy is based around and which we come to. And my, my turn to community is really to, to find other forms of knowledge, other knowledge holders, other voices, other disciplines that really can challenge the dominance and in effect um, uh, challenge mainstream society. So, you know, I really liked um, what Joseph O'Connor said at the beginning, you know, how, how do you get ca capitalism to pause uh, and, and question itself? Um, so how do you get the mainstream thinking, which is, as I said, based on rationalist economic paradigms, you know, based on the mind body, split based on an extractivist privatized uh, ecology you know how do we get to challenge that and i felt that actually increasingly after having worked for for decades with economists you know worked with decades with academics the the only way you could challenge it was to turn your back on it and to start anew and to create your own knowledge base and to create new knowledge holders and to empower and encourage different and diverse new voices so a lot of that would have to be done outside of schools which are frankly institutionalized and replicate the very thing that we want to sort of challenge and so this idea which is feeding off many different uh, experiments was to to try and create the new commons uh, but to do it without without money because money is also the currency of mainstream power and to do to do it in ways that uh, privilege um, those uh, the young people so usually teaching is from older people to young people let's try and turn that around on its head you know people who are situated in their local communities first and foremost working class people who are seen as less educated you know less knowledgeable even about their own circumstances let's bring the history of the global south and the way in which that history has been erased marginalized and still not told how do we do that in the current context and so one of the sort of uh, opportunistic, so we've got to do this opportunistically because, you know, we need to do that. So on the back of the climate and emergency um, uh, 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 movement, you know, we got, we persuaded Camden Council, which had declared a climate and ecological emergency, to convert and give us 
and collaborate on setting up an, a, a temporary agile nimble space on the high street in Kentish Town um, and to convert what was a, a closed shop into a space where you could not buy anything but where you had ex, you know an experimental space for communities to come together and I just uh, you know I, I, I you know I'm sure we can come back but some of the nicest projects and ideas came from young people so just tying in with Miranda it was actually the young people who said we want a space to focus on fast fashion for example you know again some you know which we hadn't sort of looked at we'd come up with energy efficiency and retrofits and you know rewilding and the sort of typical sort of green things but actually they came forward and said we want a, a workshop in a space on on fashion and fast fashion and actually did a brilliant debate and a clothes swap uh, and so many other things that sort of came out of it so i think what's we're trying to do, and Camden Council is committed to rolling out these spaces now across Camden, and I'm trying to find ways in which other, other groups can create their own permissionless spaces, is to create new commons. In fact, these are new commons, and we need to create the new commons and create them in ways without waiting for philanthropy, without waiting for someone else to hand us the money to start on them. So that's kind of difficult, but actually we're pioneering uh, ways in which the gift economy, volunteer-based efforts, uh, and those who are able to afford and can pay for certain things can take a step forward and to sort of tap into the hyper-local um, uh, spirit that is necessary to, to in fact, topple the, the mainstream overarching sort of structures that there are, because it can't come from the top, it has to come from the, the bottom and it has to come outside of and be a new form of power. So that's kind of a, a little nutshell to what I'm doing and why I'm doing it is because I've spent my whole life, frankly, um, trying to do it from the top and do it through treaties and law and economics and that's great and that's really needed and I'm not saying it's not necessary but actually the missing bigger piece of effort uh, is, is local, it's hyper local and it's based on new and creative uh, use of spaces and new and creative teachers uh, as well, so who are every day and all around us. Thank you. Thank you. I actually want to ask you a little bit more about the new commons, because I think that's a new concept for myself. Um, can you describe what exactly the new commons means for our audience? Well, yeah, it, I mean, basically over the last 300 years, the spaces and land, for example, that was held in common, owned by a community or governed by a community has been privatized and the same has uh, happened uh, for community centers, which are communal spaces often funded by council. So the spaces that we have, the state sector and the private sector, but there was a massive, in essence, third sector, which was owned by different kinds of communities. So whether it's playing fields, whether it's recreational facilities, whether it's uh, through the process in the UK of enclosure, common spaces, common land was privatized and given to private people for the benefit of private consumption essentially so what how can we create the new commons um, and i think it's by taking over pavements taking over public uh, shops on our high street that are closed and disused it's reimagining the forecourts of schools you know places that are already paid for frankly by our taxes in some cases or where we have a massive sort of control and convert and putting them back under the control of the community so that's what we're trying to do under think and do at least what i'm trying to do under think and do uh, and i think that to try and do it without requiring one million pounds from someone to buy the premise you know that's the that's the big novel idea and it's it's tricky but if we can use existing building existing land existing roads reimagine roads so they become commons instead of you know car spaces or car parks then we've actually got the makings of creating a much denser network of community and uh, reinventing community control over the everyday life, uh, which we've lost. And, you know, Kate Rowers, for example, in Donut Economics talks about the importance of common. So there's lots and lots of theory behind this as well for people who like a bit of theoretical background. <laughs> Thank you. Do you mind actually writing that into the chat? I think that'd be really helpful. Um, after hearing that, it makes me want to transition to Fiona, if you're willing to speak. I'm so glad you're here. Because um, I was also thinking about your work after hearing Roly 
and in making me think about wordscapes and publishing in addition to your artwork. Um, so I was, can you introduce yourself first and then um, go a little bit into your latest developments? Sure. Um, I'm Fiona Banner, AKA the Vanity Press. Um, I work, um, I, I guess I am commonly described as an artist, uh, a term that uh, seems to me increasingly strange somehow. Um, I feel that so many people are making art outside of art. Anyway, I digress slightly, but maybe not. Let's see where the conversation goes. Um, I make, uh, I work in publishing in a performative way and um, I'm currently artists, artist in residence at a place called Phytology in Bethnal Green, which is a green space that is also a uh, piece of activism, if you like, nature as activism and a project space um, for all sorts of practi practitioners um, from soilologists to um, musicians to um, educationalists. Um, recently, I've been making work in a, uh, uh, a slightly different way. I've been very interested in how to did you ask me a question? Am I responding to your question in any way, shape or form? Yes, of course. It's, I just asked about like your latest developments. Ah, yes. And it was around language, wasn't it, Sojourney? Yes. So yes. Um, in, in my work, I kind of discuss uh, language or try and deal with language and grapple with language. It's sort of truths, untruths and slipperiness and um, kind of... Uh, problems as a, uh, a currency, our, our chief um, kind of political currency um, outside of action. And recently I've been looking at and working with the discrepancy between language, um, its meaning and action. And that's taken me into um, forms of activism. Um, recently I um, collaborated with Greenpeace um, on some work that is um, happening with, in, and for the environment. Um, I made three uh, giant full stop sculptures um, out of granite that Greenpeace brought into London for me to work with. And one um, we delivered to um, the environment secretary, George Eustace, and uh, the Home Office as they share a front door and deposited it there as a sort of calling card, um, most specifically to uh, ask questions about why the marine protected areas around the UK were not being respected and honoured, but also uh, actually just to make a big fat statement about how language is being used and misused by this government. Um, so, um, then I made two other sculptures that were um, also full stop sculptures um, from the fonts Peanuts and um, Orita, and they were placed in the Dogger Bank, which is a piece of water between us and uh, it's in the North Sea. And they form part of an underwater barrier that makes it impossible for bottom trawling uh, in that area, which is a very destructive kind of fishing. So I'm really trying to think how, having been in art for quite a long time, how, how um, best to deploy my work now, how artists can um, use their agency purposefully, um, uh, thinking uh, around lots of questions of, uh, uh, around our big institutions and are they fit for purpose? And in, indeed, are they actually giving agency and power to the to the work that they um, uh, show. So big time of questioning and also really I do heartily believe that 
here we are in this moment of um, uh, of COVID, uh, very much exposed each and every one of us to our own vulnerability and um, thereby also the vulnerability of um, the very space and place and substance that we live in, which is, you know, the air, the water, the planet. And um, I think we've all seen how um, COVID could make change happen um, in terms of uh, big business changing and how people move around the world changing. If we can do it for COVID, surely we can do it for the planet. So I'm, I'm kind of optimistic about this time we're in. And if I could just add something about um, education, because we're here to think about how that can change. Uh, we are um, kind of constantly focusing on the negative, a negative future at the moment. And for young people, I think that is potentially incredibly problematic. And this is really a time when education needs to be uh, joyous, creative, and confidence creating in the deepest sense. So I, I think what the Great Imagining is seeking to do now is incredibly important and very relevant to our, to our time. Thank you. Um, Jude, I would love to um, hear about your practice with being on the stage and on screen. Um, the Great Imagining uses theater and storytelling to inspire students. So I'm curious if you can introduce yourself to the audience and then share a little bit about your latest developments with acting. You're still muted. There we go. Hello, everybody. I'm sorry I joined a little late. I, I think I turned up in the wrong meeting initially. <laughs> uh, but I found my way here. Uh, I, I, I'm an actor. I've been an actor for some time now, probably over, over 30 years in all. My early days was uh, spent, I heard someone talking about community spaces and their transformations. Uh, this was the early 80s, uh, um, where perhaps you could describe London as something a little bit different, where um, the, almost every borough seemed to have a community art centre. And it was very much that, it belonged. And uh, uh, each borough seemed also to have a theatre company attached to it. Which, is my, which was my way into the profession, because I had left, um, I had left, uh, I, I had left university, having done some plays at, um, at uh, where was it, the Edinburgh Festival, and I was thinking, well, I, I need to become a, an actor now, I feel I can do it. And uh, there was a closed shop and everything, and, eventually that was my routine i had to leave i had to i had to leave that behind and just get a proper job and it was at an art center community art center in newham the tom allen center it used to be opposite the um the theater royal stratford and th this was a this was a it really belonged to the people you had uh it was the model i think uh you were talking about fahana i hope i i pr pronounced your name right uh, where, you know, it, it belonged to the people. You had people who were doing their, um, it was the beginning of sort of break dancing and all that kind of stuff. You had that, you had artists, you had uh, people who just wanted to come in and hang out there, different generations coming in. There were, it was, it was, a, it was a lovely model and it is a model that I aspire to. Ob obviously, I mean, it was under Red Ken it had political implications and it was incredibly expensive and it had to be reined in. And eventually I guess it was reined in. Um, so I have very fond memories of that time uh, uh, of a London. And I, I don't know how far, of, how, how far afield in the other cities it was replicated, but certainly in London, there was this um, ownership of spaces 
the access to uh, it was extended in a way uh, the the every everything was free there was a spell I think a little after was where not everything was free your access to museums and exhibitions and what have you um, it, it was a lovely, it was a lovely, a lovely, a lovely feeling of ownership. Um, uh, but my, I became an actor there. I joined the theatre, theatre venture and got my first professional sort of contract because there was an equity card involved. And I then went to drama school, um, and not really wanting to, under the pressure of my father, having given up a potential career in architecture <laughs> in order to become an actor. So I went to drama school and then came out and I've been practicing ever since, mainly in theater. And uh, I guess I've always found theater an incredibly important part of general education. And it was probably crystallized in, um, in a trip I made to America. I think it was in 2013, if my memory serves me right. It was with a group called Actors from the London Stage, which, which essentially was a theatre company uh, uh, with four actors, no directors. You devised the Shakespeare between yourselves. And uh, the, the, um, the remit was that whatever you came up with in design and everything could fit into a suitcase uh and obviously no sharps and so on because it would involve a lot of traveling across america um so and also for ease of production i remember doing this uh, and part of all the remit also was that you would at each university you turned up to you would meet the faculty and uh, they would speak with you. You would perform three, three times, perhaps sometimes a bit more than three, at the university in the week you were there. And the rest of the time was taken up also teaching. And they, they instructed you as to what they needed. Uh, it was kind of using drama as a sort of tool of education. Uh, I remember famously, I mean, it was used in sociology. Uh, classes where I had to, I got a lot of bum <laughs> bum uh, uh, classes to teach. Well, very difficult, I thought. Sort of like the one was on uh, rhetoric and presentation, I guess, um, uh, and one was very practical. It was to a, a team, a class of engineers, a class of engineers who uh, who were going to use, you were going to use Shakespeare as the, uh, the model, a tool to help them present their work, some of it very dry and uh, sort of uh, by, uh, you know, chemical engineering phrases and so on. But actually, uh, it, it, they took to it like that. It was amazing. It was amazing how uh, these dry sort of presentations suddenly became full of humanity. Uh, and so, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just going on and on. Tell me if I'm being relevant or not. Um, I, <laughs> you're probably thinking, what on earth is he on about? I guess, I guess, I, I guess, what I what I'm talking about is essentially is I'm trying to sort of um, say how important I feel these educations are in our lives. Uh, part of the questions raised by this this program is about you know how do we make sense of ourselves how do we see the world is by constructing stories is you all know this it's uh, this obvious and i guess i'm just like impassioned with that and that drama really crystallizes it because it's active i remember i remember sort of um my kids were uh like yours gavin uh went to Steiner school I mean uh, and I remember sort of something very telling in 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 that uh, I think is uh, like when they were in kindergarten and um there was something about like you know 
that impulse you have to teach your children everything uh, as early as possible, you know, get them on the front foot, get them so intelligent. And so, uh, but someone said, said you know, you, you're, you're with your little infant and you're looking at a flower and the infant is smelling the flower, looking at it, filled with wonder about it and then you start it you start intervening and say oh these are stamens and those are the anthers and those are the this and that and so on uh, the question was how do you why do you why do you restrict the child to these definitions these received definitions they may have a truth in them but reserve those truths let the child experience it the child may actually be able to come up with something far richer and deeper than you've ever you've ever you've ever come up with that creative space is necessary of course there are truths you need to give your children but give them space give them time and i don't think any of us really uh depart from the need of that even when we're grown up i know that in my profession there's a something called you know the received the received sort of uh Shakespeare, if you like, the received way of doing this character. For God's sake, they're dead. They're dead pieces of theatre. And I suppose what I'm saying is that our whole approach to education should be sort of prefixed by these sort of concerns. The ability to keep a space open in the mind and in the soul for somebody to have time to take things in. And I feel like our world at the moment is careering ahead with a uh, overstimulation, over a hurry, a, comp a competitiveness that has grown more and more, um, leading parents to do what they obviously feel is right for their children, but uh, may in the long run uh, be adding stress. And rather than, uh, we are also bombarded with choices. That, that to me, too many choices is no choice. It's stress. That, that's how I see it. It's um, there's some value in simplicity and uh, the ability to see wonders in a small in a small scope, as well as sort of you know wonders in a sort of kaleidoscope of yeah. There's virtue in both, but I think the balance is tipped the other way. Uh, I don't know whether I've, I've made any sense, but that's that's what I'm kind of coming from. I'm sorry, I've joined the meeting a bit late, so perhaps I'm slightly off key. But uh, <laughs> I beg your allowance. <laughs> no, I love that idea of wonder being this boundless idea versus it being super restrained. Um, I'd love to um, thank you. I'd love to talk with Des. Um, can you first introduce yourself um, and then I'll ask your question. <laughs> oh, you're muted, sorry. Sorry, I thought I was going to say something today, but I'm going to say something else now. Um, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I started out as a journalist, um, went into TV. In fact, I actually, Roly may remember me from being in Mark uh, Cooper's department from many, many, many years ago. Um, but I got fed up with being in TV, like I got fed up with being in journalism. I ended up um, writing and doing music. So I still make films occasionally, and I still write, and I've, I've published. It. A couple of books I've got another the, the funny thing is this comes at ex the exact moment where because of lockdown I wrote a, a memoir about um, working in the media because I, I I'm when I first started out almost as soon as I started one of the things I did was uh, uncover some stories that scuppered the back to basics campaign of John Major and um, so I'd only just started I was really green and next thing I know I'm on the nationals because I'd help bring I, I, I uncovered the Tim Yeo story, which eventually led to Tony Blair being in power. It was quite funny because 
this comes up all the time for me. At one point when I was at the Times, they used to call me the man who brought down the government. But it was quite funny because all my journalistic ambitions were quickly uh, sated after a couple of years, you know, because um, I was never going to bring down another government. And I find that I've got less political as time goes on, as opposed to Fiona becoming, you know, more political and kind of, you know, bringing activism into work. I've actually gone the other way. So one of the things I do now, um, I'm just working on a, a set of um, screenplays uh, for, for something that's been picked up that's going to be a, a drama series for Netflix. But I can't talk about it, but that's what's happening. So I'm writing that at the moment. And um, at the same time, I run something called Young Directors Film School, where I, uh, it, it, unfortunately, there's no funding for it, so people have to pay to do it. We do in Hackney over the holidays, where we make a movie in a week with children aged 11 to 15 or 16. And it's really fascinating because I have gone completely the opposite, because I find my daughter and her friends are literally being drenched in issues all day, every day. And of course, they're really important issues, but virtually everyone on this panel is covering those for me. I don't need to do it as well. So I've become almost like old fashioned in a way. So one of the councils said to me, we want to do some films. Uh, like we love the dramas you do with these kids. They're amazing. And you've got CGI and you show them in the cinema and they look amazing. And um, what we'd like to do is there's this estate and we've got plenty of money for this. Um, we've got an estate, there's drugs and there's, you know, crime. And, and we'd like, you know, you to do a film with the kids developing that. And I said, about what? And they went, you know, about living on an estate with drugs and crime. And I was going, did you grow up on an estate? Because I did, right? And the last thing I would have wanted was to have been, you know, sitting in my own vomit, like a, you know, go, a dog going back to its own vomit. I wanted, I was, my head was off with poetry and music and everything. I said, if we could do a film that's aspirational, but takes them into the realms of, Doctor Who or Harry Potter or something, I'm your man. But if you want Bullet Boy 2, you know, forget it. I don't care how much money you've got. And that's what happens. So that's where I am at the moment. I'm this kind of multidisciplined person. And um, I, I, I'm i working with a lot of schools at the moment, one way or another. And it's been really, really interesting to see, not only with my daughter, but the other schools that I've been in, the variety of approaches between different schools. Um, let me ask, you, ask me your question and I'll, I'll tell you more about that. You kind of started actually answering the question for me, but if you'd like, um, I'm curious how, if you have any insight for emerging artists at this time that are youth. Yeah, I have. And I think one of the, uh, I, uh, the biggest, it, it's come up this week because I've been dealing with Mossbourne. And for those of you who aren't in, uh, some of you may know, it, it was the school that Michael Wilshaw was the first, before he went to Ofsted, uh, set up. It's the first City Academy. It does very well. It's in Hackney. And I've been working with them on something. And the thing that strikes you as soon as you go in there and spend a couple of weeks in there is this, um, although it's a state school and the kids are from Hackney and, um, uh, and they come from every variety of background, um, they're teaching them things that you would normally get at public school, actually, um, and things like uh, Oracy. Um, and I come from a terrible, we used to get food parcels. I mean, we were as poor as you can get on this terrible estate in Luton. But um, as we, uh, as I went through school, the thing that I found was that, uh, the two groups of, uh, well, really the people who got uh, help were people who were trouble. And if you were just a bog standard kind of normal kid doing all right, keeping your head down, no one takes any notice. And I think that's still the same. In schools like Mossbourne do this thing where they try to draw out the best in people by, you know, uh, uh, giving them those, uh, the tools because your career is probably going to be decided in your 20s. And if you hit 20 and it's you, meet, you know, council, uh, council estate kid Des against my mate Tim, who went to public school and been debating since he was six, it's actually really hard to compete against that. It doesn't matter about basic talent or anything. And as I've gone on through this, I keep thinking that if, if the schools can't do it, I would love to see, I would absolutely love to see some kind of mentoring scheme that goes on. Um, so that there's two things that happen. If you get to any of our ages, and none of us are that young maybe, I don't, you know, we're not 20, um, is there might be deficiencies in our understanding of young people, so from tech or whatever, we just can't compete with the 13 to 20 year olds. On the other hand, the, a 20 year old struggling artist, writer, musician, whatever, doesn't really understand the industry and everything. And I, in Deborah's question, you know, if you imagine this, the, the bluest sky, weirdest thing that you can think of, for me, it would be pairing people up, you know, an older and a young person who want to do stuff because the young person could say, say it's someone like me, I've got my new book coming out and maybe 
an 18, 20 year old will have all the brilliant ideas how to market and could actually do that. At the same time, if they're trying to get into TV, I could be teaching them the skills. There should be some kind of multi-generational swap. And I don't think you, I, there are, I, I, hang on, I look the figures up because I get this all the time. I feel so bad uh, all the time. I'm on panels and people ask me, how do I get into TV? How do I do this? And it's like, you know, there are 3.6 million people age 15 to 20. Nothing's changed that much. 200 of you will become influential. The rest of you will, you know, whatever. And it's actually really hard to do. But I think the best chance we could do, we, the best way to improve things and improve imagination would be, uh, you know, if Gavin would have been working with me, if, if, if we could change our ages and I'm back at school, someone like Gavin working with me would advance me so far. All the people I've seen who've done really well in any industry are the people who have mentors. And, and I swear to God, that's the, the secret, you know. It's how... Do, and, and in my case, I was just incredibly lucky that I didn't seem to offend anyone. So various adults took me under their wing at various points and got me through the journalism bit and then the TV bit, whatever. Without which, I mean, I, you know, I, my mum said to me once, um, you know, when, when it was time to go to A-level, she said, uh, you should go and work in Tesco's and help your dad out. And that's probably where I would have been if there hadn't been some more... Um, you know more perceptive adults who took me under their wing but that's what i so for me it's a it's a case of i know they're all being taught and they're being given all these kind of values and and they're being told to be activists and we've got to save the planet and we do and i'm really glad that everyone's doing that for me i'm a bit old-fashioned now because i think well if everyone's doing that i can go into a different space so i'm literally in the realm of imagination only and although issues will come up it's really funny the kids don't in spite of everything they're taught they if we're doing a, a session um, improvising a story there'll be one really articulate person in the class who will say let's bring in global warming or something the rest of them are off in Doctor Who territory and the, the issues are hidden below so I still like to play with that bit knowing other people are taking care of more politically conscious things I mean I, I, would, I would hate it if we suddenly went back to an era where no one was but I think it is about um, nurturing unseen talent in a way and the, i would love to see a scheme i i do mentor people i i've got five or six people that i look after for exactly that reason and it's really amazing one of them i uh, i watched her she dreamt to be a journalist and and she had she had everything going against her and she's now uh, a reporter at al jazeera and she comes she's been covering the middle east and everything and i i know I, she she would say I played a part in that she did the work and she was the clever one but you know we developed her to make sure that she, she had the skills that she would need to negotiate that territory which as I really will, will know TV is um it's a lot of the stuff in TV you know everyone's accidental in TV aren't they Rowley I've said that you're actually in my book by the way uh just briefly because we were covering that thing but everyone I, it took me a long time after I left TV to realize everyone was in it accidentally and actually every uh, everyone feels like a charlatan Everyone thinks everyone else belongs there. Everyone else thinks everyone else knows what they're doing and we'll just stumble through it. What do you think? I agree with that. <laughs> You're right, Des. Um, but actually there are, there are structural barriers to people getting into TV. So that accident works both ways and it can be and part of our generation's challenges do, to do exactly what you're doing, to open things up and mentor and actually say what you just said, which is that, you know, if, if you spot talent and, and nurture it and give people a sense of possibility, they can get in there. It is difficult. I would tell people that the, uh, there's a really easy way to get into TV and that's to write to someone um, who's a producer or something. Don't ask for a job. Don't, don't send the CV, but no one tells anyone who's a TV producer that they're any good. Uh, so you just write to them and say, oh, I saw your programme, I thought you were fantastic. And what I really liked was uh, the way you did the lighting in this bit or something. By the way, I want to be a director. Can I meet for a coffee one day? And um, four out of ten of them will say, yeah, sure, come in for a coffee. And once you've actually spoke to someone, you're in, really, eventually, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love that. I think that is brilliant. Um, I wish there was a mentoring program or scheme that was like very commercialized and made relevant. Um. Well, the trouble is it's too organic at the moment. So it would require me to bump into you and go, oh my God, you've got talent. And that's a bit of a shame, isn't it? And so the way we do things in school would mean that, you know, as I say, the problem kids get offered stuff. It used to drive me mad. The BBC would do <coughs> outreach and it would, they'd say something like, we got, can we get 20 kids who've been into trouble and understand why this is a nice thing? Um, 
you know, who've caused trouble, get them down to hang out with Trevor Nelson and do something. What about the kid who's just studying narrative and, and trying to become a filmmaker? That doesn't make any sense. Right, um, exactly. When you train, I made a film once with dogs about guide dogs. And do you know what you, what, do, you, know what you do when you've got an unruly dog to train them? Um, you don't say, get down, pet. That, you know, you turn your back on them, fold your arms and say nothing and be quiet. Because uh, it, any kind of response is encouragement, you know, and, and we're all mammals. And I, I think the same thing is like, what kind of message does it send out? If there's a hardworking kid who's actually doing the college magazine, for example, started making films, he gets ignored over the kid who smashed some windows because someone has decided that if they send him to Trevor Nelson for a couple of days, he's going to be, you know, be reformed, which he probably won't be. So some balance is what you need, you know. Yes, we have one question. It is from a primary teacher and they ask, are asking the panelists, is there any suggestion or any suggestion show to inspire creativity in the curriculum? Patty? Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think if the I think if it, like, like at the moment, for, for example, I'm writing this, this course just based on my experience, but I'm working with some other researchers as well. And uh, but basically it's, it's a framework for, 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 for people to, to move and dance. And um, I think if this, this program, this or a, a, a program like this that could run, that allowed the space that Jude was talking about for kids to breathe and, 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 just just to be able to experiment and play um, and and if it was within a structure that other schools were doing as well and then they could somehow um, so, so they produce something for example a film which then the other school the, the kids from the other group doesn't have to be a school um, also produces something and they communicate through what whatever it is they produce I think um, it's not very clear what I'm saying, but but I just think that that, that if there, there could be a, a, a way that 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 what they create in these spaces is given some value that that then is shown and can be shared, and that other other young people and children have, have gone through the same process, so they will be able to empathise with each other and be more open to, to what each other created. So there could be some kind of network where where they have a voice and a platform and what they've created connects with others and produces more understanding with others i think um and and also if 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 the course has is is a base it's not too regimented so teachers can adapt it to what they to, to what their skills are and and um but but it's just in, it's something that inspires creativity in 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 some way um and and for there to be some connection and structure that's that would be my suggestion. Um, that, that one of the things we found with film score is if we're doing the main film, uh, which might be involves 15 people, that's we work on the story together, we structure it, and then and you can see that they contribute, but they don't have ownership of it because I'm going to structure it and put it all together and shoot it professionally with cameras, whatever. And it because because uh, film production it means that maybe four of you are working at once if they're helping crew, right? So the rest of the time we give them iPads and put them into groups of two or three and say, go and make your own film over the week in the gaps and you can do anything. And I'm not going to restrict you. I'm not Ofsted registered, so I don't care what they do. As you know, as I tell them not to swear and not do anything, you know, um, sexual or, uh, you know, racist or sort of stuff. And then I just leave them to it. That stuff is, um, our stuff's brilliant. It looks great. It's really professional. You can show it in the cinemas. The parents come up after and go, I can't believe you did that in a week. But their kids are meant, th their films are mental. I mean, because they'll go off and they start experimenting with form and structure. They get no instruction. Uh, they're just being given license. And I give them the, 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 the iPads and say, you can go and do anything. And I will give them, I, I try not to, I don't hold their hands at all. You know, we just say, go. But I tell you what you've got to do is on Friday, we're going to have a popcorn session and we're going to see what you've done yeah. in front of everyone. So they're given the, the, the freedom, but they're also given a deadline. And 
yeah. always they amaze me, always. Yeah, I think it's good for there to be some kind of structure within freedom with structure, if such things, yeah. I think I think as well with um, with the advancement of like technology um, at the moment, the kind of the the analog and the digital, um, th there's such a big um, increasing uh, disparity between the two. And I, I I haven't been in a in an art classroom since I left secondary school, so I, I don't know how uh, much the Tory government has affected tangibly how art is being taught and educated in schools but from kind of um introspectively like thinking back on my time at school um from a personal perspective like i, I had a really tough time at school i hated it and I, I was really quite um like like bullied for being gay and i was too young to even know what that meant and it was just like a really kind of a traumatic time for me but the one time where i was like a superhero was in the art in the art class because I could draw better than everyone in my whole year and so then kids would like crowd around my table to see what I'd produced in that classroom but what I find problematic about that is that it's not the kid that can draw the best reproduction of life that is the best art student it's not the kid who is able to um, paint or you know sculpt the best and I think that where art education fails kids is that it doesn't allow them to find their own superpower. It doesn't enable them to actually identify what skill or talent they have in their kind of Giacometti squiggly line that has actually got beauty in it. And so I think that part of what is needed in art is like a connection into kind of mental health, it's a connection into philosophical debate, discussion, and it's really about widening the horizons of what art practice means into a more holistic whole. And so that really then needs to feel, and I think based on what Fiona has said, and there was a comment, um, Des, that you made about, you know, the movement from art into activism. I mean, talking from my Weiwei's quote, like, you know, you can't really be an artist today without being an activist. And so it's like, if you are raising kids to look at the world, these are kids that are going to have to pick up the problems that a generation or two ahead of them have created. So in a way, like, where is that space in the curriculum for kids to really have discussions about contemporary issues, but also then um, finding creative ways to be an activist? Because there's only so much you can achieve by going on a street and joining a protest on a march. But like Fiona's shown with what she's done, you know, a strong concept, a strong idea executed beautifully can create ripples in an ocean and i think that literally um and i think that what needs to happen in art is a reversal of the defunding um it needs to almost become and i'm not saying this because i'm an artist but like it, it should be the most important lesson in the school because what it does in, in, in unlocking collaborative mindsets in unlocking confidence and allowing kids to think in a more creative way will impact boardrooms will impact laboratories like it's it's about uh, so i think in a way it's about the holistic whole of how you get the most out of everything connected can i, can I quickly um uh the question you know the, the the teacher was talking about being creative with the curriculum and um and, and that's where we are, aren't we? There, there's a curriculum and it's incredibly restrictive. And I've got so much respect for teachers because um, it's so hard to be creative with that curriculum. So maybe that's somewhere where, you know, I mean, obviously it's really important to, you know, all the blue sky thinking and the dreaming and the big picture, but maybe that's a way that the artists could offer their services is little interventions into the curriculum as it stands and, and, and bits of inspiration that teachers could actually use um, in a practical sense. Um, is that okay? I just wanted to, to add something in because I've forgotten, I should have mentioned this, my daughter is 13, so she's coming up to year 10. And she said to me, because she wants to be a film director, and um, like an actual movie director, 
And at 10, there's the at year 10, there's the opportunity to leave uh, some of the things. And we only just found out about, I don't know if any of you know, if you don't, and I, I think, but bear in mind the numbers they have, probably most of you don't know. There's a thing called Elstree Screen Arts, and it's basically an academy based at Elstree. And uh, it's kind of part, it's partnered with the BBC, Leavenden Studios, Elstree Studios, whatever. And uh, it's an academy, but it, from year 10, but they, uh, about one third of the curriculum is actually training you up for the culture industries. So from photography, makeup, whatever, so they they do badly in the league tables because there's a couple of subjects that are going to be missing but one third of the t and it's a really really interesting thing and she's although we're in hackney and it's going to be a good hour and 20 minutes she come up to, she actually found out about it we looked she looked into it and she said that's where she's going for year 10 so we've got to go and apply for it because what she'll be doing is doing um so she'll probably i'm not quite sure which bits she should also be doing maths and english and stuff if you haven't heard of it look it up um elstree uh, screen arts it was the utc um, but by the time they've gone through sixth form with their links to colleges and university, um, they're, they're dealing, they're doing their uh, work experience on EastEnders and things like that. And they're training people for theatre, design, art, whatever. So uh, it's really, really interesting. If none of you know, look it up. Uh, Elstree Screen Arts, which is esaacademy.org. I found it. Sorry. Sorry. I just wanted to wrap it up. I'm sorry, Jude, okay. <laughs> to end it like that on you. Um, thank you all so much. I wish there was way more time to keep talking about this since this can be a conversation that can always happen outside of um, this session. So um, Gavin or Heather, if you have anything else you'd like to say or share before we wrap things up. Uh, I'd just like to thank everybody. It's been really fascinating and everybody who's attended as well. And I think we can really distill some really fantastic points from this as well. And um, I, I just feel that it has to start on this, at this level, this sort of crucible, this thinking, using the imagination and the power of our experiences and our criticality along with our creativity to start to move and address what's, what's, what's really, really necessary. And, you know, personally, just, you know, hearing what um, Joseph was saying about his experience at school, and I was at school years and years and years ago. And actually, I really hated exams. They made me feel physically sick. And um, I was so uh, upset and angered when Michael Gove reintroduced just um, the point basis of the exams. I felt it was destructive because I actually think that continu continuum of learning is really fundamental. Um, process. Um, you know, at any point children should be exposed to all manner of crises at home within themselves and to put everything onto a test I think is really, is really, really um, um, a very um, bad, bad, bad choice. So I think all of this about really trying to open it up and allow a lot, a lot more kind of flow between different areas and, you know, placing into that the sense of kith, the sense of place, the sense of space, the sense of the local, the sense of the trees, the sense of the birds, the sense of the flowers, the sense of the butterfly, and the scent, the smells that we have in these places as well. I think there's a whole, there's a whole, there's a whole new um, sense of place that is really there to be explored and um, brought to the surface. So, yeah, I'll pass over to Gavin. Well, thank you all for, for attending this, for, for showing up, for saying your bits. It's all been absolutely fantastic. Very, very interesting. Thank you so much to Johnny for looking after us all. And um, yeah, there is a lot going on in my head, actually, now. <laughs> I think that really, like, um, you know, th this thing about dancing around schools and, and how they are and how they're not and where children are. I mean, I think we're all connected up somehow. And um, there's a point where all those connections and all those, all that, everything we do, you know, our butterfly effect is, is, all, is all part of, of everybody else's butterfly effect. So, you know, I think that um, hopefully, you know, we can keep, get the imagining going and uh, hopefully this, the schools um, can adopt this great imagining. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.